everyone. What an exciting day for Minnesota women and women of uh, indigenous and immigrant. I'll just do a quick uh, remarks and then um, I see our panelists coming uh, through. So um, I just want to say that it's really a historic day today to open this indigenous and immigrant and uh, women of color's voices panel discussion because we believe um, the movement of, to achieve gender equity has to be included in all Minnesota uh, women and, children, and young uh, females. We hear so many um, uh, women of color that their voices are not heard when um, strategies have been developed to address the inequality of Minnesota women of color. We also hear that um, institutions don't run themselves, that placing the blame entities uh, squarely doesn't work because we know that policies that help our leaders move into the system that also perpetuate some of the disparities that exist. But we also know that um, no one wants to admit that we have created a practice of institutional exclusion and policies also perpetuate racial bias and unintentional, and unintentionally, um, and all the data demonstrates that. Um, what we want to do here is that today, uh, it provides us an opportunity to really include all Minnesota women, especially indigenous um, immigrants or women of color, to have fully participating in the creation of their future. I've realized that when we put this task, my voice is getting mercy. Um, <laughs> many of us um, say when, when we talk about inequality and everything that exists, what, what is going on, what does, it comes to through dollars and the conversation changes to money. And they say, well, what does women of color contribute to the economy? And if you look at the folders that you have, Women of color, immigrants, and, and indigenous of women, we really contribute to the economy of our state. And you can see that there are millions of dollars that we contribute that usually, and most of the time, doesn't really benefit us at all. So what we hope today is that the panelists will make clear ideas that women of uh, Im immigrants, indigenous women of color, have ideas, have solutions for their own issues, but also what they need is right to have uh, to develop the solutions and, and participate fully. If I give you some quick data of where our state lies when it comes to Minnesota's inequalities, you hear a lot about the education gap. You hear a lot about 20% of unemployment. You hear about 10, uh, five out of 10 African-American kids live in poverty. Four out of 10 American Indians live in poverty. Immigrants, especially the first generation, 78% of them are living below the poverty. Everything that um, shows that our state, the communities of color are not doing well, especially the women of color. So if you think about how women of color is thinking about her life, is if five out of 10 kids are living in poverty, they go through the school that is not doing good, the poverty is there, developmental issues exist. The, no one talks about mother's health, no one talks about how the mother feels when the kids don't do the school well, when she's living through poverty. When everything that is around her is like a turning wheel and she's trying to um, work through a system that's almost like a spider web. And there are no exit strategies at all because the, when solutions have been developed, most often time, Someone else designs it, and the women of color are called to say, what do you think? So that itself is really what is perpetuating the inequality of our state. And today, you will hear a smart uh, woman of color to tell you that to this idea of developing solutions for the communities of color and women of color has to stop. Um, so it is opportunity for us to move forward People say, let's not dwell on what is not working. Let's look at what is working. 80% of Minnesotans are doing well. 20% or 17% of communities of color are not doing well. And most of the bottom of the barrel are women of color. So I urge you to listen to our panelists today 
and see what a wonderful ideas and solutions that the mainstream cannot find they have. And it's time to give it space to women of color, indigenous and women of um, immigrants. Um, thank you very much. I would like to introduce in one of our two of our representatives, Senator Fong Hao. I'm so sorry if I said that wrong. Please welcome, uh, give your applause and hands. Yeah, I, uh, hello, okay. You did pronounce my name correctly, it's Fong Her. <laughs> so that's, that's very good. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very glad everybody's here. And I, again, uh, credit go to uh, Sandy Pappas and Represent Paul Thiessen for uh, getting, getting this to pass and make it happen. We're just uh, team members, you know, uh, behind the scene and trying to get it going. So I'm, I'm glad that I'm part of the history to, to make this change. And I'm very honored and, and proud that, you know, we're, we're uh, getting the Women Economic Security Act to develop the workforce of 21st century and this in, in the right place. I, I thought back to uh, my mom this morning when, I, when we first came to this country back, back in days, and my mom was illiterate. Where I, I came from a uh, agrarian society, you know, agriculture society, and my mom was uh, illiterate, but then in, in less than five years, she became the breadwinner of our family. And I heard the, the presenter this morning said, when women's life are changed, the children's life, and their men are changed too. So, you know, it does my, the, 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 uh, my mom uh, carry on the family does change my life, you know, and I, I owe it to her and I owe it all to you, all women leaders in this room, you know, I, and uh, one thing I wanna share with you all, uh, one of the bill that I signed on to this uh, session is the pipeline bill with Senator Bonoff, it has nothing to do with gas pipeline, but it, it's an ac acronym for uh, private investment, public education, labor industry experience. And uh, I'm gonna introduce an amendment uh, this coming week to uh, make sure that you know minority and racial diversity are included in that bill and have a strong preference. So I, yep. So, uh, I encourage you to come and see me too if you, you know, have interest in this bill. You know, we need to put everybody at the table. So thank you very much for the time and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you, Senator. I always worry mispronouncing uh, names, so I, I did it. <laughs> the next uh, representative, uh, representative, Rena Moran. She doesn't need to be introduced. Uh, she's one of our champions, and please welcome. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is really, really good to be here this morning and great to be in a company of so many, great to be in a company of so many powerful women and a few good men. I have the honor and privilege of opening up this part of the summit with a group of awesome women of color. Thank you. While the 2014 Women Economic Security Act we saw represented great progress for women and families in Minnesota, and still, there is still much work to be done. Public policy in workplaces can and must do a better job of supporting women, and more intently supporting women of color, who are essential contributors to their families, economic security, and the Minnesota economy. From wages and benefits to work-family balance to caring for children and family, Minnesota is a leader in providing workforce protection for women in Minnesota. But it's also a leader in disparities for communities of color within every system of our state. For people, there is much more to be done before our home state, in our home state, and across the nation. So for instance, I carry the pay, I carry the pay equity bill as part of the We Saw bill package, which is simply equal pay for equal work, right? And we know that women earn 80 cents to the dollar, with men earning a dollar, of course, right? But that fact is talking about white women, because Native American women, African American women, and Asian women all make 60 cents 
60 plus cents to the dollar, with Latino women making 57 cents to the dollar. And so I say to you, that is not fair, and it's not right, and it's not just. So we need to address this issue, and we need to address it now. So today we have a panel of women, women of color, who will share with you their aspirations, their goals, and their challenges. Today we will hear from a group of powerful young women who are leading the way for a better future and a stronger future that we hope will recognize and value their contributions to society, to their families, their community, and our state by allowing justice to prevail and to allow the economic security of women of color to be equal to that of not only white women, but white men. So I want to welcome and I want to thank you for your support, all of you here today, for your fight for all women to have justice in the war, and I am calling it still a war, a war on economic security in the workforce. So I thank you all for being here and have a great day. Thank you, Representative Moran. Can you hear me good with this? Okay, so I just can't hear myself, that's the thing. So without further ado, we will um, introduce our panel. And I just wanna do a quick check for Amelia Gonzalez. Oh, you are, sorry, <laughs> Nevada. Okay, then we will carry forward. So um, we'll start with our first question and I'll read the question for you in the case you don't have it in front of you. Um, the first question is, um, well, I should introduce myself. I'm Kenya um, McKnight, the president of the Black Women's Business Alliance. Um, we'll start with the first question, which we're doing a mic check, make sure the mic works. <laughs> Can we ask everyone to introduce themselves quickly for the audience? I will start myself. Uh, my name is Fertun Wali. I'm a public health practitioner and executive director of Isuron, is a Somali women-led organization. Good morning. My name is Camilla Elamin, and I am a um, community organizer at Mashin and Noor, which is a religious organization and community outreach program in North Minneapolis, as well as I am a um, longtime um, entrepreneur business owner. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Bota Urabe, and I'm senior director at Asian American Pacific Islanders in Philanthropy and the founder of a gender equity um, global campaign called Building Our Future. I'll use this. Hi, my name is Farhia Farah. I am a senior consultant with Global Law Consulting and Research Company. It's a company that I own. I also I am a small business owner with uh, about 10 employees um, in Minneapolis that provide services. Um, good morning, my name is Denise Butler. I'm currently the project coordinator for African Career Education and Resource Inc. Um, and I just joined my brother in a small business uh, staffing agency as well. Good morning, my name is Emilia Gonzalez Avalos. I'm the executive director of Navigate Minnesota, and now we're a nonprofit organization that develops leadership uh, for students that face social, legal, or economic barriers. That is, uh, we are born part, uh, in part of the undocumented immigrant rights movement. I am undocumented myself, and I'm also a human rights commissioner for the city of Richfield. Thank you, we give them a round of applause. Welcome, ladies. I just want to do a quick housekeeping and recognize Julie Gartrell and Brianna Wilson, who are timekeepers. So these ladies here will let you know when you're getting close and then when your time's up. Um, so we'll start with our first question, which is tell us a little bit about your community and the strengths of the women in your community. And we can start with, we'll start here. Oh, um, like I said, I'm, I'm undocumented, and I happen to also be a Latina from a Mex Mexico City. I was born in Mexico City, and I migrated to Minnesota in the late 90s. And uh, back when I was a teenager, there wasn't a lot of uh, migrants in the area of Minneapolis, and I was witness of how uh, the, in the, the, the leadership and really the, the strength of our communities developed part of what is now the Lake Street Cultural Corridor and started developing a lot of businesses. Uh, I, 
I saw that transformation from my teenage years to now I'm, I'm 34 and I have a daughter of my own. And we, we had a hard time just finding regular foods. Uh, we had to drive all the way from Mi Minneapolis, South Minneapolis, to Burrito Mercado here in West St. Paul. Uh, so my intersectionally, I happen to be a woman. I happen to be a Latina, but I also happen to be undocumented. And uh, we've seen a lot of changes within the past 15 years in terms of what it means to be one in Minnesota, uh, especially because when I was in high school, these conversations were not allowed to happen. Uh, we were told to not talk about it, to not disclose our status. And uh, we've seen now that there's not just enough support, but also an executive order announced the last uh, 20th of November of 2014 by President Barack Obama, which is also very relevant because that would add around $17 million to the GDP of Minnesota for the people that will qualify for this executive order. So that's uh, an expansion of deferred action, which uh, will allow students to get a, or people to get a work permit if they were brought to Minnesota before age 16 and also will allow parents of U.S. citizen kids to get a renewable three-year work permit as well. In the meantime, uh, we hope that immigration reform keeps moving. Uh, in terms of being a Latina and also having a second language, uh, we've seen also that transformation from being put in special education or seeing my first native language as a deficit, now we have a lot of champions in the state of Minnesota like Carlos Mariani and Patricia Torres Rey putting that cultural background as an asset uh, instead of a deficit, and that changes the narrative. We have a great opportunity to raise global children, and I'm very proud that my daughter is a Minnesotan, first generation born here, who speaks Spanish at home and who will learn how to develop relationships with kids from Somali descendants, from Ethiopian descendants, from Asian American descendants, and that's something that it wouldn't happen if my father wouldn't thought of migrating to Minnesota in the early 90s. So that's part of my community and who I am. Thank you. I'm here representing the Liberian community. Um, I guess you're probably um, familiar with the fact that we call this uh, state of Minnesota Little Liberia, um, with BP representing the bulk of that population where I happen to live. Um, my Brooklyn Park, <laughs> we call it BP. <laughs> I live in Brooklyn Park in the Northwest suburbs, um, and I think we have about 10,000 or more and counting Liberians just in Brooklyn Park. Um, my parents came here in the early 80s, um, you know, looking for great opportunity. My dad actually came here to go to school. And my mom, being the little hot tail that she is, <laughs> she followed him over as well. Um, and they've been here ever since. Um, you know, moved to the suburbs. That's how come we ended up in Brooklyn Park um, for, from St. Paul. Bought a home, homeowners. Um, so they moved to Brooklyn Park, um, raised their kids, you know, taught us to go to school. Um, Fill in, fit in, um, never really preached about uh, being, you know, a Liberian and what that is, basically. It was just basically fit in, do what you need to do, follow, you know, the, the protocol, the um, status quo, and you'll be successful. And I, and I did pretty much that. Um, you know, now myself a homeowner, um, you know, and a head of the household, I find that it's not just about fitting in. It's not just about following the status quo because at the end of the day, um, we are not all given the same opportunities. Um, you know, being a woman, be, 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 being a woman, being an African American woman, being a Liberian woman, you know, it has a lot of setbacks. Um, as far as, you know, I went to school, I got the same degree as many of my other female peers, but I find myself yet able to make that income bracket to actually afford to take care of my family, um, taking care of me, brothers and sisters, you know, different various generations, because from the culture I come from, that's what you do. Even um, up to this November, having to take care of an elderly father-in-law, um, you know, so it's been a lot of weight put on my household with not being able to exercise the amount of money that I'm supposed to be making, given the amount of education experience that I have. So, I mean, I really champion this opportunity to be here, to um, share some of these um, information, and then also for something like this to be um, 
a subject, you know, having women give have equal opportunity to be able to make the same amount of money, amount of money that we make. In um, the Liberian community, um, per se, we add at least $22 million to this Minnesota economy. That's just from the Liberian community. We um, own homes, but a lot of us, I don't know if the demographic has been um, pinpointed, a lot of us are still um, just DED on DED, deferred deportation. So that's a whole nother um, um, setback itself. We just have the right to work, but not really to do much else in this country. A lot of us, the older community, um, are small business owners, but that's undocumented. Um, the statistics are not there because, you know, they're not giving the opportunity to open, establish real businesses. They're doing it out of their homes. They're doing it out of office buildings. So a lot of the money that we actually could actually generate to this economy is being undocumented because we're not giving the right opportunities to become official business owners. And a lot of the women in my community are the head of the household. They are taking the brunt of the responsibility, um, taking care of the homes, caring for families here and in Liberia as well. Um, so those are just some of the di dynamics that are going on. Hold on. Hi. Uh, my name is Farhair. Uh, I, I've been uh, in the United States for almost 23 years now. Uh, uh, you know, two or three minutes is really such little time to talk about the huge, huge issues that we need to address today. But I really thank you for the great opportunity. Uh, I'll echo what everybody else says here. Investing in women is investing in the future. And, uh, and uh, our loving men and their support, we love it. But we also know that it's the women, especially the very, very poor women, that will give the greatest impact to the future generation. Um, uh, let me just share a joke with you. Uh, and it will kind of uh, uh, shed a light to some of our thinking, especially the Somali. I, uh, I was called to talk about the Somali issues. Uh, you know, when I came to the United States uh, uh, in the early 90s, it took me a while to understand that when they talk about colored women, they're actually talking about me. I've always, I've always thought, when I first heard the word colored woman, I felt, you know, the, brown, you know, the white women have brown, you know, brunette hair, blonde hair, green eyes, brown eyes, blue eyes, so it must be them, right? First impression, you know, oh yeah, they are colored. And then later on, I was told, no, 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 it's you, you are the colored. So, so this, this is just to shed some light to how there is, a, a, a change, a total different dynamics in this country, coming from a homogeneous society of the same race, the same culture, the same religion. Um, and, and you know, when you're there, you don't think the way uh, America forces you to think. So obviously, when the Somalis came here, they encountered changes, uh, uh, some cultural misunderstandings, some religious religion challenges with Muslims and Americans, but not predominantly Muslims. There's race issues and struggles going on. And, and even in the midst of all the challenges, I am so proud to say if you go to South Minneapolis, you will see a lot of business women who have opened storefront to businesses that have, uh, that have, uh, uh, that are really trying to, uh, uh, to bring in some income to their families. Now, if you look at the resilience, where did this resilience come in? You have to think of this population. You can't think of Somali women as a homogeneous population because when you look at the 40s, the 50s, and the 60 years old, they have a different outlook of life. They have different experiences and different levels of self-esteem and confidence. And they're really, the issues that we're talking about here are not in their forefront because they're not in a formal work, work community. So uh, the other women that in the Somali community that I worry a lot about are the young ones that who migrated 20 years into this country at the age of six or seven years old, who are in their 20s, early 30s, who have just you know finished college in the uh, workforce, and they are really, really struggling, including me. When you have your mother living with you away from you, she calls you and she says, I have a doctor's appointment. I want you to take me there because this is very important. Will employers, how many times will an employer allow you that? You know, so those are some of the struggles, and I'm seeing the red lights asking me to stop, but I'm mad and I have to talk a little bit about these issues. Um, hi. Um, so I think as everyone has said before, I wish we just had a lot more time because we're all asked uh, here to speak about kind of whole collective communities that, um, you know, I always try to put out the disclaimer that even though I am a part of cer certainly the political construct of Asian Americans, uh, the Asian American community is very diverse, right? In the state of Minnesota, we are almost 300,000 uh, strong, but represent over 42 ethnic uh, communities coming from over 50 countries. Um, 
So uh, I'm, gonna, I'm not trying to represent all of that. I want to give you a demographic profile just so you have a sense of uh, the vast diversity of the community that has now been lumped together as a way for us to more easily count people in this country. But then um, also um, what that does is that that aggregate um, population um, uh, gets used to determine um, uh, how the community is served. And I think that's what we are all talking about in terms of um, where some of the uh, challenges are for the community. Um, in Minnesota, the Asian American population has increased 53%, uh, and this is at a much higher rate than the national percent, um, the national uh, increase, and it's the fastest growing racial community in the state. Um, unlike the East or West Coast, because sometimes when we think about Asian Americans, we tend to think about the East or West Coast, and we don't really think about the Midwest, but the Midwest is one of the fastest growing um, Asian American um, populations. Our demographic here is uh, unique because of the Southeast Asian populations. 60% of the Asian American population here are um, Southeast Asians, and that's very different than other demographic profiles uh, across the country. Um, so, for example, the most uh, spoken Asian language is Hmong, right? Um, so, uh, besides Spanish, Hmong is the uh, second most spoken language in the state. 52% uh, are women. Um, in the community, 60% are foreign born and 72% are citizens. And of those who are able to vote, um, Asian Americans vote at the highest rate, right? Um, even more than the general population. And this is surprising because sometimes people think, well, you know, Asian Americans are, uh, um, they, they, don't, they don't participate, but we've uh, dug more deeply and I think we've kind of learned for ourselves that that's not true, right? So what gets talk, what gets shared about our communities is not always uh, the, the narrative that I think we want to tell. Um, I think the strengths in the Asian American community are that really women uh, value their heritage and often are the keepers of their histories and cultures. Uh, this is true for many communities, but it's certainly true for the Asian American community. Um, we are a resilient community and that has endured uh, generations of sanctioned racial prejudice in, in this country, right? So um, in particular for Asian women, anything from the Chinese Exclusion Act to, um, you know, the Japanese internment to now even the way that our immigration system works and bringing in highly educated workers, which mostly are men and then women are left behind. Um, and then also, uh, Minnesota happens to be one of the most um, creative places uh, in the country for Asian American artists. And a lot of that is being led by Asian American women artists um, who are really active here. So women play a really strong role in, act, um, in being um, advocates for their community's needs. And I hope that that's something that we can continue to um, build on. And then lastly, um, Asian Americans um, have strong familial uh, connections and they're the most likely to live in multi-generational um, housing. So um, almost 30% live in um, at least two generations or more, so. Uh, so good morning again. Um, all the statistics and all of the uh, uh, different issues and concerns that all of our panelists have, have voiced up until now um, magnify that till about 10 for the African-American community. Um, historically, here in Minnesota, um, the culture of the African-American community has been very vibrant and um, vivacious here through um, St. Paul, Minneapolis, um, even in Duluth and Rochester, and e even in central Minnesota. So um, the difference between what they've all experienced, you know, as, as a cultural uh, group and what we as African Americans have experienced is we've been here a little bit longer than everybody else, so we have been, um, we've gone through the, the rains pretty much, and the different levels of degradation to our community that, that has happened time and time and time again um, has kind of put us in a, in a bad situation, but uh, also in that our community is resilient. Right, so we also hold um, many of these statistics that you will hear throughout throughout this this panel this morning. Um, 
we we are by sheer number, right, outrank every ethnic group that's up here. So the numbers that we show is, is, is a little bit more of a um, disturbing numbers because of our number. It, our numbers are so big and we've been here for so, so long. We don't actually, um, we've gone through what they've gone through a couple of times over. So when you, when you look at uh, the situation here in, in Minnesota, well, even on a national level, but when you look at the situation here in Minnesota, um, we still are here. You know, so the African American family is still vibrant, even with all of our state of affairs currently. Um, we're we're big on in art, in the arts, in dance, in music, and and in in the church, in other religious organizations. That's historically been our backbone, and that's what's actually kept us going is our spirituality. So, um, with that, you know, I'll go into um, deeper you know, um, statistics when we get to a couple other questions, but um, the black woman, um, African-American woman here in Minnesota, um, she's pretty much been the backbone of keeping uh, African-Americans in this, in a state, you know, so it's not totally falling off. Um, you know, our, our mothers, our, our grandmothers are now raising our children and um, we have family members raising um, cousins and nieces and nephews as our own children, and it's just been, you know, that is the plight of, of our family. It's very uh, fragmented and, and so on and so forth. So, but on top of that, we're resilient. So with that being said, we have a lot, um, we have a lot to give. We, we've been giving a lot when it comes to education and um, um, education and, and business and um, economics, the numbers, they're staggering. However, we, it's on the rise. So we do have something to look forward to. And all of this has been just really uplifting to be a part of, to even know that we actually are on that kind of curve now. We can start to look up and say, okay, here's come, you know, the, the fresh air is coming in, if you will. So um, culture here in, in, in the African American community in Minnesota, it, it still is a vibrant one. We have a lot of work to do, though. I just want to thank, thank you, ladies. Um, you will have more time in the next round. We just needed to get to the introductions. And I know there's a lot to share, but I wanted to make sure you knew that you'll have more time. We, if you look at the uh, you know, the issues that exist in disparity, and you look at why solutions have not been developed, the word that keep comes back is um, the future has been created for the uh, communities of color without their participation. And then we say, well, what is going on here? It's because the general population don't have the skills to really develop solutions for people of color. So there is that space that needs to be happen, uh, happen and given to develop um, their own strategies. So the next question is, and look at uh, Julia and, and the other sister, so we, we make sure that we're you know, following our time. What are the aspirations and goals for women in your community? And we'll start right here. Um, so, so like I said before, the state of our fam uh, of our families, uh, mainly our men, um, as as black women, we hold such a, a heavy load on our shoulders. You know, we carry uh, the the target on our backs as well as as they do. Um, the statistics of um, the the of the system have us at a at a disadvantage, but. The aspiration and goals and, and our dreams and our hopes are similar to every um, ethnic background. What, what I would like to point out is that um, the key concepts to any aspirations and goals and, and, and hopes and dreams that we have have to be supported with you know, protective mechanisms, especially in an African American community. You know, we have so many uh, different issues that impact us. We need, we need a reduction in the risk impact. You know, we need a reduction in the negative um, chain reactions to things that happen, that have been happening for a long time. Um, you know, we want our children to go to school and graduate high school. You know, we're looking at high school. <laughs> um, 
you know, secondary education is, is a different conversation. And when we were looking at us, you know, going out to, to go to work, we want livable wage jobs. Those are dreams and hopes. Those should be, you know, innate rights that we should be able to have. We shouldn't have to hope and dream for that. We should be able to get that, you know. Um, also, establishment maintenance and, and maintenance of self-esteem and self-efficacy. That is huge in our community. We've kind of been knocked down so many times. It's like dragging dragging a dead dog, basically. It's, it, it's a lot. It really is a lot. Our young women are, our young women, uh, when I was looking at the statistics, it was, it was hurting me to look at it. Um, they are the highest um, number of um, the, the rising number of, of young women in the juvenile system, right, is, is peaking with the men. Like, like that's crazy. I, could, I couldn't believe that. So although as, as African-American women are nationally, on a national level, are the most educated, are the highest paid, and this is only in our community, this is not you know, across the board, um, are the, uh, the breadwinners, you know, 80, 87% of African-American families nationwide are breadwinners, and I think even here in Minnesota, it's, it's close to like 79%. So um, those, those basic needs are what we hope and dream for. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with the sentiment that many women uh, in our community want, want what all women want, and that's really to be able to achieve uh, educationally, economically, and, you know, to find happiness, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, and part of that is because they want to achieve their full potential to contribute to their families and communities. And uh, the question is, you know, are we doing all that we can to build on women's assets, but to also make sure that the resources that are meant to serve um, all women do so? Um, and in our community, um, I think that um, for for many, because we have um, an overwhelming um, uh, proportion of our community that came as refugees, and for many of those um, populations, for them, this is the first time that they have access to free education, right? So, um, you know, if you're the first to go to college in your family, um, is there recognition of that? But when you look at the aggregate um, data for Asian Americans, you think that um, uh, everybody is doing well educationally, and there's not that and a lot of support for um, supporting those who might be accessing education for the first time in their lives, right? And I think that the data d uh, skews that, and often that's um, really about how we choose to bring people to this country. And Minnesota, in the last decade, um, has uh, really benefited because of the industries that we have here uh, bringing in um, highly educated uh, workers. and. And a lot of those workers are coming from India and China, and we need them here. Um, but what that does is when we measure in the census, um, the, the community then is very educated. But I think if you disaggregate that and look at those who are foreign born and US born, then you start to see that actually for Asian Americans, those are who, um, well, this is the first decade that we have more, um, in particular in the Southeast Asian community, um, children who are born in this country. And um, they're, they're not doing well, right? But also our resources are, are not really um, su supporting um, their needs to achieve academically. And so I think that's a, that's a challenge for the community if we have the same aspirations for educational, economic, and um, uh, other kinds of uh, success in the community. And because women are so instrumental to the community's well-being, I think we have to pay attention to that. Um, also, the recognition that for many communities, um, being here in America has really afforded them the opportunity to address the kinds of gender challenges that we have in our communities, right? And that, um, that means that um, women want to be able to make choices for themselves and not fear being um, abused or um, all kinds of gender-based violence. But also, um, I think that they're in a unique position in our community, really understanding that we live in a system that uh, unfortunately has over 
criminalized uh, men of color, right? Um, so the challenge for us is how do you support women to make the um, choices that they need to make for themselves so that they are safe and healthy, but also not have to um, choose between um, making those choices and then um, seeing um, men in their community um, pay the prices in, in, in the legal system. Um, and then uh, lastly, I think that uh, women in our community are creative and have many solutions and unfortunately have not always been tapped to be a part of the creation of those solutions. So, you know, I would just continue to urge that. Thank you. Let me first and foremost begin by uh, saying, you know, we are, I'm very cognizant of the fact that Somalis arrived 20 years ago and when they did, they will not have been able to rise to the, to the levels they have if it wasn't for the incredible, incredible struggle, the African American. They have paved the way for us and we are very, very uh, uh, indebted to that and I'd like to recognize that. Uh, uh, the aspirations, you know, I will just echo what the other panelists say. Every mother wants her children to succeed in school. They want them to get well-paying jobs when they graduate. Everyone wants to have the, the American dream, the home with the picket fences. You know, so it's just unfortunate that we work in a system right now, and I realize the equity uh, 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 climate is on, uh, and we're very grateful for that, but we have things stuck up, unemployment disparities, employ uh, economic disparities, um, health disparities, education disparities. So a mother like me who has three children, uh, when I wake up and I think about the school system, I have things to worry about that maybe most, a lot of maybe mainstream um, Minnesotans don't, they're not, uh, uh, this is not the main concern. So uh, how do we overcome these challenges uh, uh, that we're experiencing? Uh, so when I think about uh, the, the Somalis, coming in here 20 years ago, uh, and there's a resilience that was built after years of uh, a struggle and displacement, has brought along a cultural protectiveness. And what worries me the most is the rate at which this cultural protectiveness is, is draining out. Uh, the, when you look at the community, for instance, I'm a researcher, you know, uh, uh, and before, when I was invited to this uh, uh, forum, I, I did a little look and see what are some of the statistics out there. There's none. There are no studies, uh, 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 sufficient studies uh, that have been done to, to understand where the Somalis are, the Somali women, so, uh, uh, where the strengths and the weaknesses, uh, their contribution. Uh, so it's a lot of anecdotal. And, and it is my greatest fear that my 11-year-old daughter, generation, high generation, high age men, when they become the working force in Minnesota, the system that is in place right now, and the lack of opportunity to build on that cultural protectiveness will give a very pervasive, will throw them into that pervasive hopelessness that have been experienced by a lot of, uh, of the black folks in the community. So when Farton and Kenya talks about solutions being amongst us, like we knowing what needs to be done and what buttons to touch, to turn around the tide and move the tide in the right direction, what we are actually saying is the resources that are available to make these changes, we know, we know what are some of the elements that are critical to put in these solutions that will change the tide. And I can give you many, many examples in some of this implicit biasness that is going on in institutions and in systems that I feel a good will and have the greatest intention in mind, but unfortunately are giving not the outcomes that we're looking for. So, uh, 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 so we have these aspirations, the possibilities are within realm, but empower us, and we can make it happen, right? Yeah. Need I say more? You said so brilliantly. <laughs> what more can I add to that? Um, education in the Liberian community. A lot of the kids are in ESL. There's already a disparity right there. They're not getting the same formal education that they need to be able to leave school and have an impact in this community. Um, a lot of them are in alternative schools because of behavioral problems. Teachers do not know how to deal with these type of students because of the cultural difference. Um, if you tell a Liberian they don't know how to speak English, they look at you like, 
because I have an accent and I speak colloquial does not mean English is my second language. So that right in itself right there needs to be addressed. Um, we need to stop putting these kids in ESL. We need to stop putting them in um, um, alternative schools. We need to learn how to deal with the cultural differences. Um, they start school at a younger age in, in, in Liberia. I started school at age two. By age two, I knew the president, I knew multiplication. But because of the cultural barriers here when you come to America, you're in, you're in school at five years old. So if I migrated here at age three, I'm sitting down for another two years before I get into school. So, you know, we have to address those disparities right then. Um, as far as uh, post-secondary school, that's not even an option when most of us are not graduating with the right amount of education that we need to even continue into college. So more and more, our librarians are not going to school. Um, you take in the fact that how many people live in a typical family. We don't live a thing called a nuclear family. So, you know, you have to address that right away. A nuclear family to us is mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, auntie, uncle, nieces, nephews. So you can have a household of 20 people, but maybe one person in that house is working. So now you're taking into consideration the fact that do I go to school or do I start working to help? And what am I typically going to start doing? A uh, low income, middle, you know, low wage job. Um, but I'm adding to the household income because although my dad came here and got an education, he is faulted with the fact that he's overqualified. When my mom has gotten that education, she's not getting paid, but she needs to get paid to take care of that household. So I, the student now, do not make that a priority. I'm, I'm out in the working community trying to help bring more income into that family to take care of that big family that we have. It's not just mom and dad and two kids. So, um, looking at some numbers, the, the, the most dense population within the Latino community are of little girls from ages 0 to 10. So when we talk about aspirations, my aspirations will be my daughter's reality. So that's, it's, it's not only powerful, but it's a big responsibility in the terms of what are we doing today that will impact them not only this uh, leg session, but in the years. How we're going to develop that path of uh, really freedom, justice, and healing. Because at the end of the day, it's about freedom, justice, and healing. Um, so being a, a really utopic dreamer that, that I am, when you tell me about aspirations, I start thinking about all these things and how they intersect and how we kind of work together and make things happen. And um, sustainability is key issue. And that is, does not mean just economic justice. It means access to education and the restoration in, of education in Minnesota as a mere tool of social mobility. And the numbers are not there for our kids. Uh, the racial disparities are not on just on the surface, within every high school, there's a racial wall between regular K through 12 and AP, IB, PSEO students. That's a reality that my kids will face if we don't do something today to change it. So we're not just about having that conversation. We need solutions as soon as possible. Um, safety how women can become more safe within their own homes, how that does also perceive us uh, having those interpersonal exchanges of violence. But really what it means is how, how we leave poverty, how we leave the tensions of poverty. That is safe. Um, reproductive justice. Uh, that's that's an also, also another key issue for us. Uh, our bodies, our decisions, and how we maintain those policies in place so that every single woman has the power to make decisions within their own bodies and their own families. Um, about undocumented women, Latino women in Minnesota, uh, looking at the national spectrum, 5.5 million undocumented folks will not qualify for neither executive orders. That leaves people even more into the shadows. Of those 5.5 million, about 30% are women, and they are aging women. In the state of Minnesota, or not just in the state of Minnesota, nationally, undocumented people cannot qualify for the Affordable Care Act. Um, so the solutions that we have in the state 
just you know coming from the macro level to the micro level are solutions that we brought forward. Uh, the Minnesota Dream Act was passed in 20, 20, 2013. We're very proud of that, and we have a couple of champions here in the room, so thank you, Mrs. Pappas, for that. Uh, but we also need to talk more about the pro penalty, the program penalty, how we can uh, liberate more monies, because the average award is about $700 for an undocumented student. $700 does not pay for a science class or books. It's about that, so we, we need to do more work on that. It's definitely a good, a, a great step in the right directions. Um, undocumented students can also pay in a state tuition. We were not able to do that for, since I can remember, I went to school with paying out of state tuition. So we're very happy that that's a different reality for the graduates of 2013 and 2014 and the ones that are coming back to school. Um, Healthcare, like I said, uh, affordable care is not accessible for undocumented migrants. How can we make sure that there's not preventive, just preventive care, but how we can create some kind of policy so that everybody who pitches in in, in the tax uh, pool can get some kind of uh, health care. And also, not the, the, this legislature has been introduced again, the driver's license bill. Just things have having a driver's license and be able to go in your car without the threat of being stopped and incarcerated and maybe deported is a big, big uh, concern, especially when you're a mom that wants to drive your kids around just to take them to school. You go grocery shopping, laundry, just basic things like that. Uh, so those are a few of the solutions that we've promoted. Uh, for how much time? I'm done? OK, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> so our panel will take a quick break, and we'll let Deb explain. Uh, and where are we going to start? Part two? All right, so, great. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Deborah and Mom. We would like to acknowledge um, Commissioner Kevin Lesney, who is in the audience, on his role and participation of uh, supporting um, Women's Economic Summit Act. We would like to invite you to come say a few words, Commissioner Lindsay, please. <laughs> Can you help me a round of applause, please? <laughs> <laughs> well, first off, thank you very much for the opportunity to come and speak to you. I think what you're hearing is critically important to the state of Minnesota, and that is women vitally matter. And I think it needs to be stated clearly, unequivocally, and repeated often. And I think we had a, a great start with the Women's Economic Security Act. The past legislative session, I'm very excited to the ideas which are being presented here today. And I really look forward to working with the folks on the panel, with you in the audience, and the others that could not be here, but are very passionate around these respective issues. So thank you very much, and I look forward to working with you all. <laughs> thank you, Commissioner. Okay, we have a final few minutes to go through and we are asking the final question. The final question I will start with, Amelia. And the question is, um, can you give one or two quick solu solutions that are, needs to be started right now for your community? One to two, thank you. Uh, well, I mentioned uh, this legislative session, we have the driver's license bill already authored by uh, Representative Hamilton and Bobby Champion. Uh, that's part of the solutions that we need. Uh, the release of the penalty for the Minnesota Dream Act, uh, solutions for the racial equity uh, gaps that we have in the education system, K through 12. Big yay for all day kindergarten, that's really, that, that's a good solution. Thank you very much for everybody that supported that. Um, and also, I think that's, well, I, I can come up with many ideas, but uh, transportation and transit, really, really instrumental. Keep supporting that. Thank you. Um, 
major impact in the schools right now for us would be to have uh, those, to help with those cultural barriers, um, liaisons um, in the school that uh, represent the community that we come from. So having various Liberian liaisons in the school will do um, wonders. Having access to funding. Um, as far as capital for small businesses. Like I said, a lot of women are starting businesses out of their homes, having the access to that funding, having the access to the education and the assistance, um, and access to affordable daycare as a lot of parents are working like two jobs a piece. I know in a, a typical Liberian um, couple, mom works double, that's what we call it, doubles, and that's a shift consisting from 6 a.m. in the morning till, till 2 p.m., and then another shift from 11 till um, 3 p.m. to 11 um, p.m. at night. So having affordable access to daycare and affordable daycare is huge for a typical Liberian family. I'll zip it through, too. Uh, uh, I was just debating whether I should share this story with you. Uh, last month, uh, as a small business owner, uh, I've been uh, harboring dreams of, of moving to the next level, moving away from startup and really growing this business. So I went to a banker last month. And, and walking in, sitting down with the banker, I was very confident during my drive and walk into this office. And I sat down and, you know, I've worked the last couple of years on my technical skills. I have a business that I was able to convert from $50,000 loan to over 600,000 annual income. I have uh, employed over 10 people in the last couple of years. I was able to generate a system in place. But during that time when I started, when I leased the space, I spent almost $100 loan plus my own personal income, plus my two partners, in building up somebody else's property where we had to do the heating, ventilation, electrical, plumbing, and the right to bring it up to state levels. And that's one lesson that I have learned. And to move to the next level, that's not what something I wanted to do in the next business endeavors that I had. So I go in uh, this place. and. The banker, you know, I was thinking, okay, I've significantly increased my income. I have worked on my credit. I have worked on my technical skills and my competency. I have proven record that I can do it. So, uh, uh, you know, I'm going through my check marks and I'm thinking, yes, yes, yes. So I go in there and he looks at me and the first question he asks me is, what is your net worth? And I was not ready for that. That's the first question. I said, wait, wait, wait a minute. Ask me my education level. <laughs> Ask me. It didn't matter. It didn't matter at all. So it forced me from that dialogue. I understood right away that I will not qualify for the asset acquisition that I was asset acquisition that I was hoping to do to start up this business that I that I had uh, to expand the businesses and grow that I had in mind. It didn't matter all that that I brought to the table, and nobody has ever told me this is what they want, you know. And, and I had to go back to the drawing table and, and, and really think twice, and it put me five years behind. But had someone told me this five, ten years ago, that no matter what you do, no matter how hard you work, make sure you build your net asset, because that is what matters. More than the 40, you know, the, what, $50,000, $60,000 student loan that I took, more than all the hours I've spent in the library reading and doing all the analysis, work, it really didn't matter. Number two, when you empower someone in the community, I've had two employees who've had babies last year, and in my two employees, and God is my witness, I have given them 100% of their pay six months off from their work. Mm -hmm. And I do this, and I did this, because I know their husbands make less than 24,000 and they pay $1,100 rent. And if I don't support her, I will either, it will either push her to homelessness, yeah. or, uh, uh, you know, totally, you know, and that's not my desire. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the elements that are in here reading it is, it's humanistic, it's being human. And the decision makers, if they come from these communities, understand these communities, eat lunch with them, go out, party with them, bury with them, bury with them they will understand that what they're asking is not, is not extra. You know, it's, it's, it's really sustenance and livability to the core. You know? uh, I'm a public health person, and when Fortuna asked me to talk about this, I, I can't talk to someone about, I'm working on a cardiovascular disease risk factors uh, with health partners uh, on a project. I can't talk about your cholesterol levels and your diabetes and, and controlling it if you are worried that you don't have money to buy diapers for your child. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's really what, what this is all about. Uh, uh, very quickly, if, if we go through some of the elements, 
uh, 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 this, uh, Somali women businesses seem to be less structured, less formal than Somali men, if I put the comparison side by side. They're less likely to have business plan, even less likely to even have a bank account. Uh, uh, the, they are really, in my opinion, the 40s, 50s, and 60-year-old women who, who are owning these small businesses uh, are, are working uh, from from uh, the spirit inside them, and not enough technical skill to really understand this. And if they, if I were to put a magic wand right here, I would say develop some technical skills to support these women because they are they, they have done half the work. How do we help them understand this is where your profit is? How do we help them think you don't have to operate in an isolated market? Minnesota is big. How many of you have gone to a Somali stall? In, in, in? Fantastic, fantastic. Spend your dollars there, support them. Whenever I go there to buy something and they say, it's, this skirt is $20, but I'll make it $18. I said, no, keep the $2, because I know more than the cash register ringing, it's the self-esteem, the self-confidence, and the self-worth that matters a lot, and that is what trickles down to the babies, to the children they have. All right, let it go. I just want to remind you that you, you will have, um, if we can get through, uh, Final closing statement. Okay. I was going to say, I think we should just close there. <laughs> that was terrific. Um, you know, when we thought about putting this panel together, we started about we we start we wanted to start on building on the assets, and that's why in your folder we have that uh, sheet that talks about the contributions of um, women of um, uh, indigenous uh, immigrant and women of color. Um, I think um, what's been said is that you know we're not coming here to just simply ask for a handout, right? that women of color, immigrant and indigenous women, uh, contribute into the system. The question is, how are we creating opportunities and access um, for, for those women? So because I work in philanthropy, I know most about the field of philanthropy. And we know that in Minnesota, uh, for example, Asian Americans receive uh, less than 1% of philanthropic support, right? Um, state dollars are a lot there's a lot more difficult to measure and you know we can argue about the data but when we look at the disparities um, it doesn't lie right um, so what i see often is that in our communities women are um, self-financing solutions right so whether that's like really starting their own businesses or um you know creating organizations where it's all volunteers or you know putting in their um own money in order to you know create anything from language programs or to um uh to serving communities um doing mentoring doing all kinds of things so for me it's it is really about how are we going to make sure that uh indigenous women of color and immigrant women um are um have access and opportunities um to resources that support their ideas and solutions um and then i, I think you know the final thought is really about how do we look at the status of women in Minnesota and um, think about women, white women's status as really not the ceiling, but the floor, right? And, um, and if we look at white women's status as the floor, how do we make sure that we're uh, raising the bottom for um, all communities who are below that? So, um, you know, we need to continue to push because women collectively, um, we have a long way to go to achieve equity. But it's also important to make sure that we are not supporting um, solutions where um, I think in particular immigrant women of color and um, uh, indigenous women are being um, used as wedges against each other. So that's it. So, um, um, for how, yeah, I, I have to say this to you that, that and, and to the, everyone in the room, I, a couple of years ago, I seen that gap. Um, your story it resonates with me heavily. Um, it resonated with me, with my family's business as well as my business. And um, that is 
kind of pushed me to bark, embark upon my business currently, which is helping businesses build business, um, structure their business correctly, right, and build business credit, um, like how the capitalist system is actually set up for us to, um, for everyone to actually, um, to use it correctly. So that is what I do. I train small businesses how to structure their businesses. And I hear this story a hundred times over, a hundred times over, um, not just from, um, you know, small businesses, even medium-sized businesses, that haven't, you say 1% uh, of, of um, Asian women get philanthropy dollars. Well, African Americans get probably a 0.2% of that, you know, so the, it's, 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 I feel your pain, and, and what, that is kind of what pushed me to go out to find, get the keys to, to the doors. And, and then begin to share it, and then begin to share that with um, um, everyone who I knew, <laughs> basically. So let's talk. But um, <laughs> outside of that, uh, uh, two things. I, uh, Representative Loom, I'm, I'm very encouraged that uh, for, for what she stated, because uh, one of my biggest blocks um, and the solutions to um, what reviving the African American community was stabilizing, the stabilization of the black families with um, quality, quality, and I'm gonna say it again, quality, early childhood education. Our children are our future, and that is not just a uh, soundbite. That is truly what, what we look um, for to in, in when we set out, you know, outside of one, once we once we marry, once once we start to have children. So um, that is very uh, very encouraging to know that that is already in play. The other thing is um, like uh, the sister from Liberia, or she was saying, the ability to attain economic set of sufficiency, having uh, getting actually making livable wages one right, and then supporting women owned businesses is key. It's key, it, just on a simple note that is so key um, across the whole line, you know, women owning the businesses are the backbone. We are the backbone of this country. Those small businesses that President Obama talked about, right, 85% of them are African, I'm sorry, are women. Not just African American women, but women. Period. So we have to really take that seriously. We have to put a lot behind that, um, and not just these uh, fluffed up um, pots of money. I'm talking about real money, <laughs> real money. So um, those are my two issues. Um, I just want to thank everybody. Can we give a round of applause to our panelists? My goodness. Um, Thank you so much. I want to thank Deborah, um, Barbara Batista, and all the WESA um, group, and then Kenya McKnight is going to be doing the closing remarks. Can you take it away? Sorry, uh, I, I wanted to say something before we leave. Uh, actually, I want to correct myself. The amount of increasing the uh, GDP in Minnesota from uh, the executive order is going to be $1,700 million, increase in the GDP of Minnesota. That's a lot of women building power, economic power and sustainability right there. Uh, so another thing is uh, maintaining first language as an asset in um, the school system. And pipelines for democracy leadership. We need more women representing women, women of color representing women in general as well. Uh, so that's that's all I wanted to add at the end. I felt like I, I was having a hot potato with the microphone, so I apologize. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I do want to recognize Carla Smith and Williams for providing us with some wonderful entertainment. Um, complimentary of the Black Women's Women's Alliance and Miss Jessica White in the back there who's doing the photography for us as well. Sarah, Sarah, I'm sorry, Sarah, just because that's the top of my mind. So in, in closing, um, again, we want to thank the RISA team for um, uh, giving us the space and opportunity to share some of our cultural perspectives, values, aspirations, and solutions with you um, from our own perspectives and interests. And while I realize the panel, um, we have so much to share that the 50 minutes allotted is not enough time, but I hope that it was a great appetizer for you to get some insight um, as to uh, some of the things that we're thinking um, in our cultural realities. In essence, um, our strength is our unity. 
um, as women in general, but specifically as women of color who we are typically played against each other, where sometimes some of our communities are more interesting than others. And, um, you know, particularly I'll tell you the um, uh, Native American, American Indian, and African American historical communities, of course, Native being much more historical, Native to America, um, often fall into that bracket where we do feel that because we do speak English and we've been here longer, that we have of less interest to Caucasian people. And in that, we feel that we're left behind in the barriers a lot. And if you look at the disparities across the country, you will find that those are the two cultural groups that they are deeply rooted with. And so um, it, it brings some light to our perspectives and realities. However, in that, we also recognize that our other newer communities, um, who we love and respect and who brings more vitality to uh, the whole community of color are also assets and also members of um, our economy here in Minnesota. In closing, I'll just say that what we're essentially saying is that we matter, we have value, we contribute to humanity, and part of our mission and goal is to break down the institutional, institutional racial structures that prevent us from being successful women for um, successful women in our pursuit for happiness in this country, liberty, and justice for our communities, for our futures. We will be, as you may know, by 2045. Um, currently, America, for the first time in its history, children of color are the majority of this country. And those numbers will continue to increase. In our metropolitan region, we will see um, more than 43% of the people of color in the metropolitan cities in Minnesota will be of color. And it is our duty and our job to create a structure by which all of our communities have access to equal opportunity in the state of Minnesota. And again, while we recognize that we are women, we also understand that white women and women of color, there are major disparities between us. And we ask you to stand with us, to be advocates, to be supporters, to our prosperity in this country and in this, in this state. Thank you.